Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Ahsoka Episode 6, Far, Far Away, a title that evokes the classic Star Wars blue text that was invoked by Jason Sindula last episode, the phrase Far, Far Away proving to be the answer to the question of where Thrawn went, as well as the answer to this question. Where are the turtles? So many cool questions and deeper bits of historical lore tying into this episode, so let's take it scene by scene for all the details you might have missed, and thanks to Mistplay for sponsoring this video, more about them in a moment. And again, we really, really appreciate you tuning into these Star Wars analyses. It's honestly an honor to stay up late writing these breakdowns every week. I just care a lot about this series, and I want to share all of that with you. So let's dive in. Okay, over that Lucasfilm opening, we hear this. According to the closed captioning, distant Purgle calls. But we don't begin this episode distant from the Purgle, we open with them inside of one. So this call being distant tells us that we are actually hearing this call from the perception of the three great mothers of Peridia, native Dathomiri, night sisters who harnessed these Purgle. This call is how they know the Jedi is coming. Hyperspace in this opening shot looks different than we've ever seen it before in Star Wars. Normally it's a glowing blue tunnel surrounding the Traveler. Now it's streaks of teal and pink and yellow and orange, all the colors in the visible spectrum, streaking past the whales, streaking between each other and under their fins. It's just such a cool way of showing that this form of hyperspace travel is beyond the kind that we've seen before, because we are traveling from galaxy to galaxy. Now, you may remember that moment in The Mandalorian Chapter 17, when Grogu and Din Djarin were traveling through hyperspace and Grogu saw a purgle. And I might be crazy, but in this shot, for a few frames on the right side of the screen, you do see a blur through hyperspace on the other side of this that could, could be Din's in one Starfighter. I had to scrub through it all frame by frame to see this. I think I honestly spent an hour staring at this shot, but now I can't like unsee it. Now you may be asking, would the timeline match up? Ahsoka Tano doesn't appear in The Mandalorian Season 3, but Captain Carson Tiva does appear on both seasons, and I suppose it's possible for his mission with Hera on CTOS happens before all that stuff he got into with The Mandalorian and like Tim Meadows in The Mandalorian Season 3. But you know, for all we know, the Purgle could be bending time with their form of hyperspace travel. I just want this to be true. Let me have it. Ahsoka tells Hu Yang that she remembers a Purgle from the stories that he would tell them. When we were younglings back at the temple. Ah, yes. History of the galaxy parts one, two, and three. One being the best, of course. I love this. It could be a meta nod to the Star Wars original trilogy, where I would definitely say the first is the best, but you know, I can respect the opinion that The Empire Strikes Back might be better. Although, we could also see parts one, two, and three as the three trilogies, the prequels, the original trilogy, and the sequel trilogy. And Ahsoka might be saying that the prequels are the best, because that would be more of her era, but really, she spans all the eras. Look, if you legit think that the prequels are better than the original trilogy, no shame. I just think Ahsoka would be more into a trilogy that ends with Anakin being redeemed rather than one that ends in tragedy for him, even if Dave Filoni identifies most with the prequel era. But that's just our meta understanding of this. What does this mean for the characters in the universe? George Lucas originally conceived his Star Wars narrative as the Journal of the Wills, with the Skywalker saga being an epic myth told by an advanced alien race called the Wills to inspire their youth, which is why every film would begin with the phrase a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, which again supplies this episode with its title and is a phrase now being examined by this Ahsoka series as we, for the first time, travel from one galaxy within the Star Wars universe to another. But what would the actual in-universe history of the galaxy be that Hu Yang would tell all these young Jedi? Currently, the accepted chronology begins with something called the Wellspring of Life, the birthplace of midichlorians. This gets explored in Clone Wars Season 6, Episodes 11 and 12. Episode 11 takes Yoda to Dagobah, where he hears Qui-Gon's voice explaining to him that all living things form the living force, and that feeds the more abstract cosmic force. And that cosmic force is contained in this wellspring. So in Episode 12, Death Destiny, Yoda heads to that wellspring and encounters inside of it this kind of planet geysering up all this metachlorian energy, and he encounters these five masked priestesses who each represent emotions and put Yoda through various trials. It's a really cool arc, and it's really where life began in this galaxy. Sometime after this, the gods of Mortis came to live in the ethereal realm of Mortis, and then eons after that, sometime around 25,000 BBY, the Dai Bindu, an order of priests who were precursors to the Jedi, established what became the Jedi Order 
on Ach To, led by the Prime Jedi, which was the figure depicted in that mosaic pool that Luke sat beside in The Last Jedi. And I feel like that last part of it, the Dai Bindu, would be the part one that Hu Yang would have told Ahsoka about, the dawn of the Jedi Order. As the wellspring of life and Mortis were kind of surprises to Yoda and Ahsoka and Obi-Wan and Anakin, like while these mythological elements might have been buried somewhere in the Jedi archives, I don't think it's something that Hu Yang would have been programmed with and told us bedtime stories to all these young Jedi on the Crucible. Then again, in Rebel Season 4, Palpatine and his like archaeologist friend did kind of mention how the Jedi archives mentioned the gods of Mortis. I just don't know how much all the Jedi younglings would know about it. Still, they are important for us to know, and I will explain why later. Anyway, Ahsoka worries that Sabine went with Balin willingly and that she didn't have enough time to train Sabine how to make the right choice, but Hu Yang says the Force provides insight but doesn't give all the answers. Perhaps for Sabine, it was the only choice. A choice she made for herself. That is your fear. Ah, fear. He's implying that fear is a path to the dark side. You know, it leads to anger, hate, suffering. He's saying, don't let fear corrupt your mind, Ahsoka. So Ahsoka takes the note and she forces the fear out of her mind. Getting back to some stories. And second thought, tell me one of those stories. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, and I love it because that is what Star Wars is for us. A way for us to escape our anxieties and just lose ourselves in some great stories. And this is actually the first time we hear this spoken aloud in Star Wars. But unlike the Wills in some other galaxy telling the story of Star Wars, Hu Yang must be talking about beings from another galaxy from his perspective who came to this galaxy and settled it. Those could be the celestial deities like the Mortis gods, but this episode also implies other races like the Death of Miri originate from other galaxies. So let's move on. When the Eye of Scion exits hyperspace, it leaves a trail that crackles with electric bolts, which feels like a Sithy violation of nature. Like they weren't meant to go on this journey. Like notice also that ring was smoldering orange when it first arrives and then cools down. Like it really feels like they pushed it to the limit. So they approach the planet Peridia, surrounded by a ring, which turns out it's composed of pergal bones. The Sita star map depicted Peridia surrounded by a ring of pergal, but I didn't know that meant a ring of dead pergal. Morgan says Peridia is the ancient homeworld of my ancestors, the Dathomiri. So the Dathomiri, the people of the planet Dathomir, home to Maul's mother, Mother Talzin, were not originally native to that planet Dathomir. They settled that planet after migrating from another galaxy, and they just named it after their own race. This is a huge deal. Morgan says of the Purgle, My people were among the first to harness and ride the creatures in the days before time was counted. Jeez, between the Purgle and Danny Trejo telling us the witches of Dathomir also used to ride the Rancors? These witches were just writing everything. Now in Star Wars Legends, the ancient Rakata were the first to use hyperspace technology, and based on that blue kyber crystal celebrating the Rakatan uprising mentioned in Andor Episode 4, the Rakatans are Star Wars canon, but Morgan says that the Death of Miri were among the first, so there could have been like a few of them. But she says the days before time was counted, which would be old, predating recorded history, predating the Jedi Order. Because when the Jedi started, they were counting years back then. Balin says, Peridia. It was a graveyard. Ah, so it wasn't a fairy tale that he grew up hearing, it was more of a ghost story. A trek that Purgo make at the end of their lives, kind of like elephants migrating back to their known burial sites. That's a real thing, folks. That elephant graveyard in the Lion King was based on a real ritual that these massive mammals do. It sounds like Purgle do a similar thing. Their dropship takes them past towering statues of Night Sister heads atop towering pillars, with their mouths contorted in this grotesque scream. I wonder if these could function as amplifiers for the Great Mother's voices that echo back to Morgan through time and in space. The statues on Arcana, remember, were full statues that had bodies and feet, but just their heads severed. This is kind of the opposite. It's just heads on skinny, skinny pillars. It's kind of creepy, like they're giant pest dispensers, but it looks so cool. Remember, the statues inside the ruins on Arcana were not screaming like this. They looked at peace. So I just kind of like the idea that it's the witches who stayed who cry, and it's the witches who left who listen. They approach this towering structure built into the side of the cliff that looks a lot like a dour Minas Tirith from Return of the King, a top the statue is a more pristine version of the Cetas ruins, the slabs uncorrupted by the elements. And Morgan finds here three Night Sisters, the Great Mothers. According to the episode credits, their names are Lachesis, played by Jane Edwina Seymour, who played the Borg Queen in Star Trek Picard. She's on the right with the rounded headdress. Clotho, played by Claudia Black from Stargate SG-1 and played Chloe Frazier from the Uncharted games. She's in the center with a single pointed headdress who does most of the talking. And then Actropa, played by Gerald Prescott Galleon, known for playing Madame Xanadu, 
Sue on the Swamp Thing show, she's on the left with the two pointed headdress. So these names are a fascinating choice because Lachesis, Clotho, and Atropos are the names of the three fates of Greek mythology that we've referenced before. Those fates were also known as the Morai, which is where De Filoni got the name of Ahsoka's bird companion that represents a daughter of Mortis. Now these witches, of course, wear similar red headdresses that Mother Talzin wore, and that appearance was based off of original designs for the Sith, created for the Phantom Menace, and then repurposed for Clone Wars. But the fact that these three headdresses that we see here are all slightly different could be telling us something, because in Greek mythology, Clotho is the youngest, and she spins the thread of human life, Lachesis is the middle, who measures the thread, and then Atropos is the oldest, who cuts that thread and decides when people die. So this Clotho, with a K, has the headdress with one point, like the pointed needle that spins a thread. Lachesis has the rounded headdress, but Atropa, who would cut the thread of life, has a two-pointed headdress, like scissors! But of course, these were the three witches that Sabine referred to when she figured out how to unlock the spear in episode one. But since those ruins were thousands of years old, I'm wondering if there must always be three caretaker witches on Peridia. It's kind of like something that gets passed on generation after generation. But yes, these were the voices that Morgan and Elspeth heard calling to her on Cetos. Episode two was titled Toil and Trouble, which was an allusion to the three witches of Macbeth. Devil, devil, toil and trouble, fire, burn, and cauldron, bubble. Like the fates of Greek mythology, they tell the future. They tell the future of Macbeth, but it's always cryptic. Anytime a political leader tries to use this magic, it always blows up in their face. Clotho says, Welcome, child of Dathomir. You do our ancestors credit. She speaks with additional voices layered on top of her own, kind of like Mother Talzin often did. It's like when one of them talks, all three of them are talking. They speak for all the witches of Dathomir throughout time. Atropa says, It reeks of Jedi. And Lachesis confirms, it is dangerous. And this angle is especially creepy because it's from Sabine's point of view as Jane Edwina Seymour looks directly into the lens of the camera. But they refer to Sabine as it, disrespecting Jedi as animals, like false practitioners of the Force. Because yeah, it sounds like they predate the Jedi Order, but it also indicates that Sabine does have some connection to the Force, or at least a connection to Ahsoka. But my question is, do they smell this Jedi doo-doo on Balin? Because later they seem surprised when Balin is revealed as a former Jedi by Thrawn. So Balin just must be really good at blocking walking away that light side of the force. Like the three witches in the Arcana ruins, they hover the spheres over their own palms and yeesh those fingernails. It's just an interesting point to compare to Sabine because we saw Sabine's fingernails in episode two that her fingernail polish was chipped. And I like how the red beams that form between these spheres kind of work like rope that ties someone up. It's a kind of mystical thread being the weapon of these three witches that are based on the fates and they're controlling the threads of fate. Three creatures howl at the Peridia Tower. Dave Filoni's wolf obsession coming back, but rather than wolves or loath wolves or anything, these are the Howlers that we see later, which share their name with reptilian creatures from Jedi Knight, Jedi Academy, but these seem to be more canine and horse-like. The VFX on these things are actually pretty good. You kind of forget that they're not actually there. Balin's dialogue in this episode is fascinating. This is a land of dreams and madness. Children's stories come to life. He describes Pretty as a kind of archetypal forest, kind of like in A Midsummer Night's Dream where magic can happen. But remember, he called this place a graveyard. So it's a place where magic once lived, but when it was abandoned, the magic started to fade away. Kind of like the ruins of Valyria in A Song of Ice and Fire. The doom of Valyria led to the gradual death of the dragons and magic leaving this world altogether. But Shin Hati says that she didn't grow up with these stories, but Balin says, Stories of this galaxy are considered folk tales from ancient past long forgotten. With good reason. Sometimes stories are just stories. Yeah, it's kind of a bit of commentary on how sacred we should hold these Star Wars stories. I love stories about stories, but with Shin's response, it kind of feels like to the younger Star Wars fan, what was sacred to the older generation might not be as sacred to them. Balin says that he watched the Jedi Temple burn and he couldn't make sense of it at the time, but as you get older, look at history and realize it's all inevitable. Fall of the Jedi, rise of the Empire. It repeats again and again. Again. Now, George Lucas would describe this as, oh, it's like poetry, it rhymes. But for Balin, someone living inside of this story, he's just sick of the cycle. So when Shin asks him if Thrawn will give them power, Balin says, that sort of power is fleeting. What I seek is the beginning. So I may finally bring this cycle to an end. So Balin is on a fascinating quest, kind of like what Daenerys Targaryen spoke of in season five, wanting to break the wheel before she just kind of forgot about all that in season seven and eight. He wants a deeper power on Peridia beyond Thrawn. That beginning is here. 
if the old stories are true. I have some thoughts on what this could be later. All of us have a mobile game or two we can't put down, but thanks to Mistplay, you can earn gift cards while you play. Mistplay is a loyalty app for mobile gamers. They have a vast library of games covering every genre you can think of, from casual games to in-depth RPGs, puzzle games, and more. The more you play your favorite game, the more points you earn to redeem your gift cards at your favorite stores. This includes Amazon, Walmart, Xbox, PlayStation, and a ton of other places, including Visa, which, you know, is kind of all stores. If you are a mobile gamer, Misplay is a no-brainer. You could be earning points right now. To get started, click the link in the video description and make sure to use code ROCKSTARS30 inside the app to get 30 free points, which will help toward redeeming your first gift card. Code expires October 31st and is limited to the first 20,000, so do not wait. So inner dungeon Sabine whispers, so now, in episode five, when Ahsoka was pulled out of that water, she said Anakin, but we heard a female voice whisper from the cosmos. Female voice might have been Sabine in this moment. Sabine tries to use the force to escape the dungeon, and for a second it seems like it's working! But nope, the rumbling is actually from the Chimera, the Star Destroyer of Grand Admiral Thrawn that we saw in Rebels. The Great Mothers and Morgan watch it arrive, and I love how Clotho seems to be holding a rope or some prayer beads, as she would be the fate who initially spins that thread of life. But the Chimera is framed perfectly so that it looks like it's rising from that tower, kept alive by Night Sister Sorcerer. You can see one of its top spherical shield generators and several plates all over its hull are augmented with gold parts, like the material the Eye of Scion and Morgan's dropship are made out of. These golden additions may be repairs after the Purgle wrap their tentacles around this ship or to make it so that the Chimera can easily attach to the Eye of Scion and get that hyperspace toe. You'll notice that its underbelly has the same painted pattern that it had in Rebels and I just cannot get over the symmetry of the shot, perfectly bisected by the fold of the hull and the corner of the tower. Power, looks so good. It's worth remembering that since the Chimera got zipped off to hyperspace by the Purgle in the Rebels finale, it still has on board, presumably, the pieces of the Lothal Jedi Temple that Palpatine tried to use to corrupt Ezra. Thrawn's forces are revealed. I think this is my favorite needle drop Kevin Kiner has ever composed thus far. The organ plus the electric distortion just hits so hard. It's such an uncommon sound in Star Wars and it's done to shock us with this unlikely return of a face that you do not normally see in Star Wars. Thrawn's stormtroopers chant his name. They still worship this guy despite their dwindling numbers and their broken armor. Yeah, their armor looks awesome. It's been nine years since their exile in the Rebels finale. Their armor's dirty. It's got mismatched parts, probably taken from some of the dwindling numbers, used to replace the broken pieces on the people who are still surviving. And it is all cracked. It's held together with red cloth, which shows how their wounds have been nursed by these witches of the red cloth. And their imperial conformity has been fused with a uniquely Dathomirian aesthetic. We actually saw some red cloth wrapped around Maul's temple behind that bonfire on Dathomir in the Rebel Season 3 episode, Visions and Voices. Now, the captain of these stormtroopers is Enoch, played by Wes Chatham from The Expanse. His stormtrooper mask has been fully broken and pieced back together almost in the style of Japanese kintsugi art, but with a golden face mask, kind of like Tigress of Gaul and Gladiator, a bit like the golden mask of General Clytus from Flash Gordon, which was a huge influence on George Lucas in the early Star Wars films. So it just shows how Enoch is part of a post-imperial cult of Thrawn, Thrawn being someone who always loved art and history. Actually, the name Enoch comes from the Bible, who was a human who became the immediate attendant to the throne of God, a human who actually got to enter heaven as a human. This reflects Enoch being at the side of this godly figure of Thrawn. Now, Lars Mikkelsen voiced Thrawn in Rebels and plays him here, and images of this guy from trailers just do not do him justice because really it is his voice that makes the character so good. He enters with one of the sickest opening lines in live action of any Star Wars character ever. What was first just a dream has become a frightening reality for those who may oppose us. Holy shit. Remember, Balin described Peridia as a land of dreams and madness. It's almost like Thrawn might have heard him with that because his response here is, what was first a dream has become a frightening reality. Sorcerers deal in dreams, military strategists deal in reality. So a reminder, Thrawn is a chiss with blue skin, red eyes, and I love how they kept the V-shaped indentation on his forehead. We've talked before about Thrawn's origins from Timothy Zahn's 1991 novel, Heir to the Empire, and Dave Filoni bringing Thrawn back in a canon as the villain of Rebel season three and Four. Watch our Rebels recap series for more info on this guy. I also did a whole Thrawn timeline video back in April. But just seeing him here carrying himself with pomp and majesty, it is exactly true to form for Thrawn. But 
That said, notice how they allowed Lars Mikkelsen to keep his normal aged appearance and his build. If you look closely at his white uniform, it has been wrinkled and frayed in some parts, especially on the collar. Despite Thrawn's best efforts, he cannot hide the toll nine years has taken on him. Thrawn is now the Napoleon Bonaparte of Star Wars, Napoleon being one of history's greatest military strategists who took over France as a dictator and a god king, then exiled to Elba, and then made a grand return to power before his final defeat at the Battle of Waterloo. Thrawn is about to depart his Elba. Thrawn says Enoch will begin the cargo transfer as per Thrawn's agreement with the Great Mothers. Morgan says, I have seen the catacombs. It will take some time. So what is this cargo? They actually went into that in an amazing episode of Wookiee Leaks that came out last night. Go check it out. But actually later, we see Thrawn's men moving these casket-shaped containers from the tower to the Chimera. I think these are corpses of past Night Sisters and Night Brothers on Peridia that the Great Mothers want to resurrect in this other galaxy. Kind of like what we saw Talzin doing with the zombified corpses in Clone Wars. It's not just this small army of stormtroopers that Thrawn plans to return with. He's going to come back with a true army of the dead. Actually, later Later, when we see one of these caskets floating past the camera, it shakes with an unnatural rattle. Mothers, you wish to speak with me. And as Thrawn tells Morgan, Death and resurrection are common deceptions played out by both Night Sister and Jedi. A clue that these Night Sisters plot to resurrect their dead. Actually, Marok may have been their first experiment at doing just that. So back in this scene, Thrawn recognizes Balin. Then you must be General Balin Skull. Of the Jedi Order. He calls him General. Thrawn knows that Balin had a military rank as a fighter in the Clone Wars. This shows his expertise. He knows all the names, kind of like Batman knows all the names of the detectives and the cops and the GCPD. So then Thrawn meets Sabine, recalling her as one of those rebels he chased down in Rebel Season 3 and 4. Thrawn is shocked that Sabine's obsession with finding Ezra was worth so much to her. How that singular focus will reshape our galaxy. You've gambled the fate of your galaxy on that belief. You can see in his eyes, though, some uncertainty over this loose thread, kind of like a chess master trying to outsmart someone who is just kind of winging it. That's one of the most frustrating people for chess masters to play. Sabine gets a howler and blasters and Ezra's lightsaber back, and Enoch says, Die well. Who cold? It is the kind of thing a stormtrooper on this graveyard planet for nine years just trying to make the most of his death would say. Sabine uses the same kind of scanner that Han used to look for Luke on Hoth and Empire. Hera actually used a bulkier version of it last episode on Cetos. But Sabine gets attacked by Marauders. But whereas before she's been a better shot with her blasters and not as good with the lightsaber, now it's the opposite. She has to resort to the lightsaber, and with the lightsaber she successfully finishes them off. Now as Balin and Shin ride out from the castle, it does have some runes written along the top. This is not the alphabet we figured out for our end credit star map video. It's a different language. It kind of looks like the Sith language of Urkatat, but it's not that either because this would predate that. These kind of look like the runes that were on the inside of the chalice that Maul had Ezra drink from on Dathomir when he used the Night Sister magic to combine their minds. Meanwhile, Thrawn and Morgan observe this galaxy star map, which I'm going to assume is not the galaxy Peridia is in, but the main galaxy star map as it's all charted out, whereas I don't think the Peridia galaxy would be as charted. So it looks like Thrawn is making plans for where to strike when he returns. We get some lighthearted hijinks this episode of Sabine shaming the Howler and then meeting the Noti, which are nomadic creatures akin to turtles or crabs that disguise themselves as rocks. Yeah, they're a lot like the Ewoks, but there's more pragmatism. They seem a bit further along. Like they wear multi-layered clothes with fasteners made out of teeth. My wife pointed this out, but those might not be shells that are part of their anatomy, but rather shell backpacks that they wear. Because think about it, how else would they get these slim fitting clothes on their bodies? But this Noti recognizes the rebel insignia on Sabine's pauldron because he has a similar patch, proving that they know Ezra Bridger. It makes sense that Ezra would get along with these guys, as throughout Rebels, he loved to disguise himself in different uniforms and using silly synonyms. Like at some points, he calls himself Jabba the Hutt and Lando Calrissian. Balin finds a severed staff to know Sabine's lightsaber severed this, and Balin tells Shin about Ezra Bridger. Comes from a breed of Bokin Jedi trained in the wild after the temple fell. Bokin refers to the wooden training swords that we saw Ahsoka and Sabine using in episode 3. So this just kind of refers to a, a homeschooled Jedi. But Balin tells Shin that she's not a Jedi. He was trained as a Jedi. You, I trained to be something more. Now, Balin says that he misses the idea of the Jedi Order, but not the true weakness of the Jedi Order. And he sees the future here on this planet in what was once the great Witch Kingdom of the Dathomiri. And he says while the Great Mothers are fleeing, Balin sees an opportunity. Perhaps they flee a power greater than their own. Something calls to me. Can't you hear it? Something stirs here. Can't you see it? 
So what is this greater power in this Peridian wasteland beyond Thrawn that the Great Mothers are fleeing but Balin is drawn to? Maybe the Mortis Gods, which might explain Balin's reluctance to kill Ahsoka because Ahsoka has the spirit of the daughter inside of her. Maybe Balin is drawn to the purest form of the Force religion through the father before it was bastardized by the corruptible Jedi Order. But maybe this great power is Bendu, the Force being in Rebel Season 3 that eluded Thrawn and predicted Thrawn's defeat at the Arms of the Purgle. Remember, Bendu was kind of an agnostic. He reached out to both Kanan and Ezra and Maul, and in the Rebel Season 3 finale, he equally destroyed Imperial forces and the Rebel fleet. He's kind of on neither side, and it would be really fun for Thrawn to see Bendu again. But I'm going to throw another theory at you. That power that Balin recognizes could be the priestesses from the Wellspring of Life. What if the Night Sisters branched out from those priestesses, and the priestesses cast them out of the wellspring like Lucifer from heaven and then banish them to this hell of Peridia. The reason why the Dathomiri might have migrated to our galaxy could have been some gradual attempt to get closer and closer back into that Garden of Eden. I gotta dig into this in another video because it's really heady and there's a lot of moving parts. But Sabine follows the Noti to their lakeside village with rounded trailers that kind of looks like the shells that they wear. It looks like the females of this group wear shawls over their heads. There's just a lot of good world building with these things. And then our man Ezra Bridger returns. I knew I could count on you. He appears out of focus over Sabine's left shoulder, just as Anakin appeared to Ahsoka in the World Between Worlds. Iman Asfandi plays Ezra Bridger nine years older, and he has a beard, and he looks just like his father Ephraim Bridger. Even with the hand on the hip, he has animated Ezra's crystal blue eyes and that wrist tech that Ezra wore on his left arm throughout the Rebel series. Sabine and Ezra pick up right where they left off with some playful banter that they always had. Typical. Always a plan. Never a good one. Hey, it worked, didn't it? Didn't it? And I love that sudden seriousness from Ezra. Like, think about it, for nine years, Ezra would not have known if Lothal was saved or if the rebels ever had a chance of defeating the Empire. He just kind of had to make peace with being completely out of the fight and being completely in the blind. But Ezra asks how Sabine found him, like how she got there, and she ducks this difficult conversation the same way Ahsoka sidestepped Hu Yang's difficult questions in the opening scene. Once Ezra finds out what Sabine sacrificed to get here, I don't think he's gonna be very happy. But the Great Mothers warn Thrawn that another Jedi approaches, and he susses it out who it is. Could it be the recently deceased Ahsoka Tano? He tells Morgan that death and resurrection are common deceptions played out by both Night Sister and Jedi. And since Balin was a former Jedi, his words should be treated as flawed. Thrawn says, I want to know her background, history, her world, her master, everything. Yes, this is always a huge part of Thrawn's strategic approach to learn everything about his enemy, their history, their art, and weaponize it. And it's interesting that he doesn't know that Ahsoka's master was Anakin Skywalker, something that Balin's skull knew, but he was part of the Jedi Order during the Clone Wars. Thrawn wasn't, he was a military figure. But there is evidence from various books that Thrawn was one of the few people who deduced that Anakin Skywalker and Darth Vader were the same person. So as soon as he finds out that Anakin Skywalker was a master, he's gonna know that Darth Vader was her master. Thrawn orders to destroy any approaching star whales with prejudice, and he turns back to the Great Mothers. Great Mothers, I shall once again require the aid of your dark magic. The thread of destiny demands it, Grand Admiral. So the closed captioning spells this magic. M-A-G-I-C-K, which gives it a more supernatural metaphysical quality. Like magic with a K is what witches do. But he says once again, so what past instance did Thrawn use the Great Mother's magic other than to summon Morgan Elspeth? Like in a way that he could use it again. Could it have been these mothers that drew Ahsoka into the world between worlds to wrestle with Ahsoka's demons and that Ahsoka just successfully passed that test? Did they actually use the Lothal Jedi Temple that is still on the Chimera to do this? Look, make no mistake folks, Thrawn's respect for this magic is transactional at best. And the real story here is the relationships that Ahsoka and Balin Skull have to the fairy tales that they were told as kids. Are the stories true or are they only fantasies that happen in a galaxy far, far away? Thank you so, so much for watching this breakdown. You can support our channel by grabbing an Ahsoka inspired Fulcrum shirt available at nerdriot.shop. Please subscribe to The Break Room for all of our episodes of WikiLeaks, our Ahsoka After Show, and subscribe to all three channels of the New Rockstars Network. Thanks to Noah Chen for helping write and research this breakdown. You can follow me at EA Voss. Following the rock stars. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.